This week, Francis Haugen, a former Facebook employee, has been talking to MPs in London about online harm. But is something more nefarious afoot? Is this a grave threat to free speech? I'm joined now by Ben Smith, the New York Times media columnist, and Glenn Greenwald, the journalist who's based in Brazil. Ben, I'll start with you. In your column, uh, or last column, you described Frances Haugen as a power player. As far as I can see it, she's not exactly a whistleblower in the normal sense of the word, even though everybody's calling her a whistleblower. Did I? Yikes. Um, uh, you know, I guess I think she is actually a fairly traditional whistleblower. She's somebody who works inside a big institution who didn't like what she saw and went to, um, to the government and the media. Also taking with her a huge trove of documents. Um, you know, I do think there is a, for a lot of people in that position, there's basically a choice that I know Glenn has, you know, it's a difficult choice actually of do you, you know, do you stay secret? In which case the only people who know you, who you are, are your enemies, which is to say the people you used to work for, or do you become public either because you like the idea of being a public figure and an advocate or because it provides a kind of protection and makes it harder for your former employer to go after you, but also makes you a target and potentially a li- and, and turns you into sort of a line of attack and a distraction potentially from the documents and from what you, what you leaked. And, you know, I do think there's this sort of question of, and I think the journal didn't really write much about Haugen. Her point of view wasn't particularly reflected in their articles. Like they took the, you know, they looked at the documents, they took their own line on them um, and didn't kind of filter them through her lens, which I think is basically appropriate. But and she has a kind of a eccentric lens. I mean, that's the wrong word, but like not a conventional set of views. She's against encryption. She's for certain kinds. She, she has a lot of thoughts about algorithms. She doesn't have a, a, a sort of set of views that fits neatly into the political landscape. You're being very fair there, but she was at some point, her, her calls, her whistleblowing was taken over by uh, a communication firm run by Bill Burton, who's a uh, former uh, Deputy White House press, press Secretary under Obama. Um, there's a, there is a politicised agenda behind um, her press campaign, and it's become coordinated with lots of different other magazines now, hasn't it? Magazines? I don't think there's a large magazine conspiracy and here. No, I, I mean, mean what she, I'm saying she, is at some point in September, used... which is to say, so she, she went to a firm called Whistleblower Aid, which is a nonprofit law firm that helped her through, and that she worked with, I think, through much of the year. So she, and by which point she'd given the Wall Street Journal all these documents. And the journal, most, I think to me, like the most, there's been a lot of interesting writing about these documents, but the journals is, I mean, they had a lot of time with them and it's really the definitive stuff. Um, and, and so, and then come, I guess, mid-September, so after all that's done, and, and just as she was about to go on 60 Minutes, she hired a fancy PR firm, but and, and and there is now a kind of swirl of conspiracy around her fancy PR firm. But I don't know if I was a whistleblower who was about to go in 60 Minutes, I'd probably hire a fancy PR firm to help me prepare. Like, I don't think there was, I don't know. And, and, and yeah, I, I mean, I having dug into it a bit, I, I, there was less of that than I expected, honestly. I, what I meant by the other media titles is that she just got, other media titles got involved with it. Well, she offered, I mean, there was a huge, I mean, she has this huge trove of documents. She'd given them exclusively to the journal. Everybody else wanted them. You know, she had a point of view on who she wanted to have them and how she, you know, and I think there is, again, like always a question of, do you just dump them all on the internet for interpretation, misinterpretation? You know, they're, they're full of unredacted names of random individuals who work for Facebook. Do you give them to a reporter who will interpret them? I think she's trying to find some kind of middle ground where she gives them to a lot of reporters who will interpret them. So, which I don't think it's been, like, perfectly executed, but I don't think it's that interesting. Glenn, you know a fair bit about whistleblowing. Uh, what do you think about this story? And what do you think about Whistleblower Aid, which is a group that is funded by your old boss? Yeah, I think the question of whether she's a whistleblower is a little bit of a semantic distraction. I largely agree with Ben that she did take documents without authorization from a powerful corporation and brought them to the media for public reporting because she believed the public had the right to know. In that sense, I think she falls at least into a very broadly defined range of what whistleblowing is. Generally, whistleblowing by its definition means you're blowing the whistle on wrongdoing or corruption. And that's where I think the question is interesting. I'm not, I don't think 
that the document she revealed told us very much about Facebook we didn't already know. There has been reporting on almost all of this, as opposed to say what Edward Snowden revealed, which basically nobody knew, or Chelsea Manning, which basically nobody knew. Most of what she these documents are revealing are things that have been a, alleged about Facebook or even demonstrated about Facebook for a long time. I think what's more interesting is how she's being weaponized. And the central storyline of her emergence is really not these documents, but her wide range of opinions, some of which Ben alluded to. She's against encryption. She doesn't think Facebook should be uh, smashed or broken up under antitrust laws. She obviously does believe, though, there's insufficient amounts of censorship or content moderation, whatever you want to call it. And that's where I do think that the groups that are working with her come into play because it, the context for all of this is that the Democratic Party since 2016 blamed Facebook for their loss to Trump. They have blamed Facebook over the last four years for the emergence of right wing uh, ideologues and polemicists and for giving them a platform. They obviously are agitating for greater censorship of them. And so the fact that she's working, for example, with this whistleblower aid group, which is funded in part by Pierre Omidyar, the former, uh, my former publisher at The Intercept, um, who has a lot of strong opinions about the need for greater content moderation. And whistleblower aid itself is founded by Mark Zaid, who kind of became this social media celebrity by spending four years just publishing standard anti-Trump resistance direct on Twitter. And it's a very odd kind of label for this organization claiming they're in defense of whistleblowers since Mark Zaid was one of the primary and still is critics of both Julian Assange and Edward Snowden believes that both should be imprisoned for decades, a really weird whistleblower advocate. He seems much more interested in whistleblowers when they advanced a certain agenda. So that I think is what matters is how she's being exploited. She's in London to talk about a bill that may impose criminal penalties on social media companies that allow content that governments or whoever believe is harmful or foul in the words of Boris Johnson. There's a clear agenda going on that in part she agrees with, but I think in part she's being exploited to advance. And the, the agenda seems to be pushed quite happily by let's call it legacy media, you know, traditional media. Um, is this just a sort of uh, resentment among uh, our industry for what Facebook is doing to us? I don't think it's just that. I mean, obviously, Facebook is a huge competitor to the largest corporate media outlets, but also to small newspapers. Small newspapers are dying across the United States in large part because Google and Facebook have taken all the ad revenue that once sustained them. So this competition is very real. I think though there's on the level of national media, an ideological war going on for who, I mean, the Facebook is one of the most potent instruments ever devised for controlling the dissemination of information around the world. There are 2 billion users or however many are, are, are is the accurate count. It has incredible influence as, do, as does Google's YouTube on the politics of numerous geostrategically critical countries. And I think what's going on is a war over who gets to wield that power. Do we leave that power in the hands of Mark Zuckerberg and Google executives to decide what can and can't be heard on the internet? Or do we allow tech reporters at the New York Times and disinformation units of NBC News to pressure these companies to censor more in accordance with their ideology? Or do we allow the Democratic Party, as they're doing, to explicitly threaten these companies and if they don't start censoring more, they'll be subjected to regulatory and legal reprisals, or even in the UK and Canada where they're being threatened with criminal prosecution if they don't censor more. I think that's really what the key context here is, is that Facebook is, and Google are uniquely powerful weapons of information and there's a war going on currently over who gets to decide how those weapons are utilized. Um, so I, I hesitate to pick a fight, an argument with Glenn Greenwald, because not only will I lose, but he will never let it go and will be, will be owning me on Twitter for, for years to come. Um, but I, I think that he oversimplified this in various ways. One is that the, you know, as, I totally agree that Francis Haugen's um, revelations were not 
on an order of magnitude of Edward Snowden's weren't. But but I also think that, you know, what exactly is new is complicated. A lot of the things that Snowden revealed were in some ways known. There had been earlier whistleblowers. You had been writing about them, Glenn. That's why he found you. Not everything, not a lot of the worst details. But sometimes a, a new massively causes something to break into the public consciousness and the legislative cons consciousness, even though bits and pieces of it were previously known. And so, I, and I think that that's true here, the, that I told, she couldn't, there wasn't some massive new revelation, but for instance, the kind of detailed internal conversations about what happened after they switched to this metric called meaningful social engagement, what the internal arguments were, what the trade-offs were, how they, you, you know, what the internal recommendations they took and ignored were, was really new and was interesting, I thought, and, and wasn't, it was sort of the, the, the technical mechanics of stuff that you could see from the outside. Um, so I think that was new. And then I think, I guess I don't really think the word censorship is the right word here. There is real censorship. Trump was, del you know, Trump's account was suspended. That's censorship, clearly. But I don't think a choice... So fa Facebook banned the linking to the New York Post article or Twitter banned yeah. it and Facebook suppressed yeah, that's, it. That, 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 sure, censorship, censorship right? seems like a good word for that. But whether you show my, whether, whether you actively display content is it, well, I mean I, I I'm gonna post that the vaccine puts magnets in your body and it causes you to get magnetized I kind of think I should probably be allowed to post that on my personal Facebook page the choice of whether to distribute that to your grandmother or not is a complicated choice and whether you do it or not it's not sent to a stranger who doesn't follow me just because lots, lots of people argue with me I post something and say and lots of people argue with me Facebook then chooses to display it to my grandmother to your grandmother who has no connection to me I don't think it's calling for censorship to say, hey, don't display that to Glenn's grandmother. It is calling for not amplifying, for muting or downplaying certain kinds of information. It's an argument about distribution, but I don't think censorship's the right word for that. Like Facebook's making an active decision to display insane and sane and wonderful things and bad things and the dress, which I published at BuzzFeed and was wonderful, to lots and lots of people who didn't actually sign up and ask for that thing, right? So... I don't think it's censorship to not. Ben, it's quite odd, is it not, that it, it is always Facebook at these sort of governmental inquiries. It's always Facebook that is in the, the sites of governments. I think if the spectator was as powerful as Facebook, lots of people would care about the well, spectator. Yes, but there's other, there's yeah, other... except, except, I mean, probably the most powerful company um, is, is not even Facebook, but Google. And there seems to be a lot less attention on, on them. Um, I mean, they're more powerful, I think, in enormous ways, including yeah, what right. you end up finding on the internet. Obviously, they control YouTube, which is a, a gigantic platform. There was just a really interesting article today in the New York Times on scientists who are mapping out the brains of fruit flies. And in order to do that, they need to rely on Google's artificial intelligence scientists, which Google basically has a virtual monopoly on. Um, and very few people know even what it is that they're doing. I think Google's probably the most powerful company ever in existence. So I think it is interesting that there is so much attention on Facebook. And I think part of that is sometimes just kind of a little bit of a coincidence that there was this person from Facebook. Maybe if there was from Google, we'd be talking about Google instead. But I think Facebook has become more of a lightning rod because, and this often gets lost, is most of these tech executives, these founders of companies like Jack Dorsey and, and certainly Mark Zuckerberg, when they began, their vision was never that they would be involved in censorship fights or content moderation or whatever you want to call it. Obviously, why would they want that? They wanted as many people on their platforms as possible. They didn't want to be in the process, in the habit of kicking people off. But beyond that, they, have, they came from this kind of libertarian ideology. I mean, if you read kind of the triumphalist, euphoric, essays about the power of the internet in the mid 90s and into the aughts, it was very much this idea that it would empower human beings to communicate without the interference of centralized corporate and state control. That was the ideology that they grew out of. And a lot of this censorship that these companies now practice are the byproduct of the fact that they're receiving tons of external pressure from corporate media outlets, from Democratic Party, from there's various- such, There's such naivete to say that what's happening on Facebook is communication without corporate or state control, when in fact you have a highly centralized corporation making decisions about what gets distributed. No, I think it's it, no, more but exactly, a, reali no, a realization that, 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 I know, that there's but, always that control. I know, but, no, but, those decisions. but when they began, there was none. And when Twitter began, well, I mean, they were there was none. 
And when Google actually started, their idea was we'll never tinker with the algorithms. And the reason this happened, if you go and talk to people like Jack Dorsey or Mark Zuckerberg, is they'll say, we this obligation was foisted upon us by a society that told us that if we don't undertake this responsibility to police the internet responsibly, that the results of free speech and the blood that it sheds will be on our hands. Well, they and also they're clearly they're, ben, ben, they're, there clearly role. is a very aggressive and coordinated campaign to pressure these companies to censor more. Democratic members of Congress have summoned these tech executives four times in the last 12 months to be interrogated before them. And each time they say to them explicitly, our problem with you is not that you're censoring too much. It's that you're not censoring enough. And if you don't start getting more hate speech and disinformation as we understand it off of your platforms, you're going to pay a price legally and, and in terms of regulation. That is the conflict explicitly being undertaken. I mean, I think I agree with you on the motivations around kind of the post-Trump freak out and seeing Facebook as the sole reason or Russia in there their kind of. But I also think that there was a shift from like no one is there is no call to censor my texts with you, even if we are fomenting, if even if I'm texting you disinformation, because there's an understanding that like that that's a passive medium that AT and T is providing us to text. There, the, Facebook, when it was displaying things in a reverse chronological feed from your friends, was a different company than when Facebook was choosing which content to distribute and 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 spread widely and which not. And once they are making those choices, it seems totally reasonable for lots of different people to have opinions on the choices that they're making. It's not passive. It's not neutral. There's no there's no neutral space where they're just saying, well, we're just throwing it all out there and whatever wins, wins. It's all active choices. And so I don't see why lots of people shouldn't have opinions on those choices that they're making about what to publish and what to distribute. Right. So I, let me just, I think this is the key. I totally agree that this distinction that Ben is drawing between passive permission to users to publish whatever they want and active decisions to algorithmically promote or suppress things is a critical distinction. Once they get into the role of algorithmically promoting or suppressing, they're really kind of like a, a publisher, like the New York Times, actually. And Ben is right. Once you start making those choices, you can be criticized. Like People criticize the New York Times all the time for stuff that they choose to publish or withhold. The difference, though, is if the Democratic Party started dragging, you know, executive editors and senior Imagine editors of the New York Times before the Congress executives. to say, you better stop publishing op-eds like this or we're going to be punishing you legally. People would understand that's really menacing. Think so it, if I, what Facebook I, and Google do are doing is similar, that we should see the same danger there. I think it is dangerous and menacing. I think also... Remember the phrase, what was it, vast cultural wasteland? Television executives were always getting dragged in front of Congress to get yelled at about the garbage they were spreading. That's long, I mean, you know, that's 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 most of the second half of the 20th century. I mean, I don't think yeah, that's... And, 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 pressure, and, 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 and people reacted to that very poorly. Like part, the reason that part of the reason there is television news, love it or hate it, that is fat, tries to be factual and fair is because they were under all this pressure from Congress and from citizens not just to provide entertaining garbage. I mean, like that was that's that's the history of the television industry. This isn't some like radical new twist. No, exactly. I agree that if de if the Democratic Party was saying my opinion about Facebook is it permits too much right wing opinion to be heard, that it makes Ben Shapiro be able to reach five million people, and that seems bad. I'd have no problem with that. When you start saying if you continue to allow Ben P Shapiro to be heard on your platform, we're going to pass laws or enact regulations designed to punish you in, in retaliation for allowing ideas that we dislike to be heard, then it becomes an entirely different type of, of, of reaction. You move from critique to state control. And there's actually you know, Supreme Court cases that say, obviously, the First Amendment bars the Congress from directly censoring, right? Congress couldn't pass a law that said Facebook is hereby prohibited from allowing any pro-Republican Party content on their platform. But there's case law where state officials in the past have kind of coerced or implicitly threatened bookstores or other book distributors to say, if you continue to allow these books that we think are too risque to be available in the bookstore, you're going to have a lot of problems with their zoning commission. And state, 
you know, the Supreme Court has said, once you start doing that kind of coercion, you really get into a realm where it becomes more like the kind of direct censorship the First Amendment prohibits. Ben, just to say, I, I, mean, I can listen to you both argue about free speech all along, but I know Ben's got to go. Ben, I'll let you have the last word, then I think we better wrap it up. Oh, wow, the last word. I mean, I, th- I guess I, th- I agree with a lot of what Ben's saying, uh, what Glenn is saying. I think there's a ton of danger here when the government is involved in, in speech. I just think that, and I guess in some ways it's easier to t- for me to talk about the vaccines and stuff than about politics because I think there's less space for legitimate disagreement. And I think the question, which I think is actually hard to answer, is, you know, how many cops would have marched on New York City Hall yesterday denouncing vaccines without Facebook, Right. I'm not really sure. I actually don't. I think that that's a really interesting question. But I think probably some that there probably is some effect on something that is just obviously making society like just an obvious social ill that I think it's reasonable for legislators to think about, you know, how can you improve public health by getting people vaccinated and not have people spread lies about vaccines? That doesn't seem crazy to me. I totally agree. It's a foot on a slippery slope and all sorts of other crazy stuff. But I don't know. I I don't think it's that simple. Glenn and Ben, thank you very much indeed.